We are here tonight to study from the book of Acts. We'll be looking at Acts chapter 27, at least the first half of that chapter in just a few moments. So if you could find a Bible and turn with me to Acts chapter 27, that would be ideal. We will have the text on the screen. If you're able to have access to that, that's great. But if you have a Bible in your lap on your own, something you can take notes on, uh, that would certainly be preferred. So hope you can meet me in Acts chapter 27 in just a few moments. Hope to see you this coming Sunday at 9 and 11, and then also at 10 o'clock for the Bible class in between those two services. So early worship at 9, a late service at 11. That gives us some more room to spread out. I know the, the virus seems kind of bad right now. Everything, I don't know. So we'll see how that goes. But uh, hopefully we can still be together and enjoy each other's fellowship and be spread out a little bit and be as safe as we can. So I'm looking forward to seeing you this coming. Sunday, if at all possible, at 9 or 11, and then for the Bible class in between as well at 10 o'clock. Uh, tonight we are continuing in our study of the book of Acts. So this is the book of gospel action, or some of the acts of some of the apostles, as it has been described. It is written by Luke, the beloved physician, a good friend of Paul, a helper of Paul, and he's writing to a man by the name of Theophilus, and he's giving Theophilus a history of the early church. By way of very brief review, just in case there is some chance that you are here for the first time tonight, we've been looking at the ABCs of Acts as a memory tool. And so we've assigned a successive letter of the English alphabet for each chapter in this book. The Ascension in chapter 1, beginning of the church, carried and cured, determined disciples, empty jail, first deacons with the question mark, great hero, Stephen of course, how can I, I am Jesus, journey to Joppa, kingdom includes Gentiles, liberated again, missionary sent out. Not gods, but men. Old law is not binding. Philippian jailer converted. Questions answered in Athens. Reasoning with a preacher. Saving our religious friends. Troas on the Lord's Day. Uproar in Jerusalem. Valuable citizenship. Waiting to kill Paul. The excuses of Felix. Yet untried by Caesar. And then last week we looked at the fact that Paul was zealous toward God as he explained his former way of life to King Agrippa. And tonight the summary of Acts chapter 27 is arriving safely on shore. So we are going back to the letter A. Unfortunately, Acts has 28 chapters in it, so it uh, doesn't fit the uh, alphabet too well, but we're going back to A and B again for the last two chapters here. So arriving safely on shore. Uh, however, we will not quite be arriving safely on shore tonight, but instead we will be on a, a ship in danger in the Mediterranean Sea in tonight's class. And so I, I suppose I'm uh, kind of slightly sorry for spoiling what comes next, but next week, if the Lord wills, uh, we will be arriving safely on the shore. Uh, over the past few chapters spanning several years, Paul has been in danger in Jerusalem. Basically, the Jewish leadership is trying to kill him for preaching the gospel. And to avoid that situation, knowing that there's no way for him to get a fair trial in Jerusalem, as an innocent man and as a Roman citizen, he has appealed to Caesar. And this was a legal move that Roman citizens were allowed to make. And yet it presented some challenges for Paul. So he was not allowed then to just go free, but from the moment he claimed his uh, appeal to Caesar, he was then forced to go to Rome and answer to the emperor. So we are now finding a way in the book of Acts to get Paul from Caesarea to the city of Rome to face the emperor. So let's pick up tonight then with Acts chapter 27 verses 1 through 8. The first paragraph in Acts 27. Acts 27 verses 1 through 8. When it was decided that we would sail for Italy, they proceeded to deliver Paul and some other prisoners to a centurion of the Augustan cohort named Julius. And embarking in an Adramidian ship, which was about to sail to the regions along the coast of Asia, we put out to sea, accompanied by Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica. The next day we put in at Sidon, and Julius treated Paul with consideration and allowed him to go to his friends and receive care. From there we put out to sea and sailed under the shelter of Cyprus, because the winds were contrary. When we had sailed through the sea along the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we landed at Myra in Lycia. There the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing for Italy, and he put us aboard it. When we had sailed slowly for a good many days, and with difficulty had arrived off Sinaitis, since the wind did not permit us to go farther, we sailed under the shelter of Crete, 
off Salmone, and with difficulty sailing past it, we came to a place called Fair Havens, which was near the city of La Silla. One thing we notice at the beginning here is that Festus and King Agrippa, the authorities in Caesarea, they find a centurion, and they give him the mission of delivering Paul and a number of other prisoners to Rome. So apparently they are uh, in the habit of doing this, so a, a prisoner transport here. Uh, we aren't given the number of prisoners as opposed to the number of crew and the other passengers, but by the time we get to the end of this chapter on a second ship, we do know that the total is 276, and that's a lot of people on one ship, at least in my mind. Um, but we can imagine a, a chain gang of some kind as these prisoners are moved onto the ship, all chained together. Uh, the centurion's name is Julian, and that's a little bit unusual for us. This, is, uh, this guy is one of only two centurions to actually be named in the Bible. We have at least, I think, half a dozen or maybe more centurions referred to in Scripture, but we only have names of two of them. Uh, Cornelius, of course, earlier in this book, and now we find this guy's name is Julian, which is a great honor to be mentioned in Scripture. He was an honorable man, as all Roman centurions in the Bible seem to be. They are always referenced in a positive light. The other thing we notice right away in the uh, first few verses here is how Luke says that we would sail to Italy. So I hope that jumped out at you after we've been in this book for a number of months now. Uh, as we've noted several times previously, that we in this verse indicates what? It shows us that Luke is along for the ride on this one. So Luke, as the author of this book, he will be heading to Rome alongside Paul. And I don't know about all of you, but if I were a prisoner with some health issues being transported hundreds of miles on a ship 2,000 years ago, I would love to have a good friend who is a medical doctor along for the ride. And that is exactly what it seems God arranges here. So Paul is in good hands and Dr. Luke is along for this journey with him. And what a sacrifice on Luke's part to uh, ride along on this ship with Paul, um, with Paul being a prisoner. So this is what we see in the last two chapters of Acts. Luke is with Paul on this very dangerous journey from Caesarea to the city of Rome. Uh, since we have quite a few names of places in this passage, we have a map on the screen. Uh, it uh, wasn't on this map, but uh, the first place name in Acts chapter 27 is a reference to where this ship is from. It is an Adramidian ship, and I've, I've put a star very roughly where this port was located based on looking it up on other maps online. So it was not too far from Troas on the far western shore of what is now the nation of Turkey. And just like today, a ship may have a home base, but they obviously spend most of their time out and around. And this ship, it seems, was normally used to travel along the coast of Asia, maybe running from Sidon up to Adramidium, and then back again, over and over and over, back and forth, back and forth along that coast. Uh, most likely then, the ship is on its way home to Adramidium so they can wrap up the season and stay there for the rent winter, so they're getting ready to call it quits for the season. Uh, so Julius then decides to get on this ship with Luke and Paul and an unknown number of additional prisoners. So instead of some kind of ship owned by the Roman Empire, they go commercial, don't they? So maybe not enough prisoners to be worth it. I don't know what the deal is there, but he finds this ship with enough room on board and they get on there. In verse 2, we learn they are accompanied by Aristarchus. Aristarchus is referred to previously in Acts 19.29 with reference to the riot in Ephesus where Luke says the city was filled with the confusion and they rushed with one accord into the theater, dragging along Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia. Aristarchus then has been traveling with Paul for some time. We have a reference to him being in Troas. Also in Acts chapter 20, he continues on this journey as well. He's from Thessalonica over in Macedonia. He's referred to as Paul's fellow prisoner over in the book of Colossians, so he is imprisoned at some time. And also, he's referred to as Paul's fellow worker in the book of Philemon. And his name means best ruler, Aristarchus, best ruler. So he might have been an official of some kind. You know, he might have been the best ruler, or I don't know if that's kind of like uh, when you get a, a mug that says world's best dad. Maybe there can be two best rulers. I'm not sure about that. Or it might have nothing to do with what he did for a living at all. Maybe like uh, his parents thought that that was a cool name. Uh, Baxter, by the way, goes back to a word meaning baker. My name does not mean that I'm a baker. I was named after somebody with the name Baxter. And he was not a baker either. 
Uh, so Aristarchus then may or may not have really been the best ruler. I'm just pointing that out here by way of uh, just noting what his name means. From Caesarea, they then set out from Sidon. And in verse 3, we find that Julius, the centurion, treats Paul with consideration. And I'm assuming this goes both ways. So Paul was not a jerk to this man. And in return, Julian treated him with some uh, dignity as well. Several weeks ago, I spent several hours with somebody in the ER at St. Mary's Hospital here in Madison. We were there in the, the lobby for a few hours and then back, and then we came out uh, when we were done there. But uh, for an hour or two, we sat across from a police officer who was there that night with a prisoner. And so I don't think I'd ever seen that in the ER before. I'm sure that happens all the time. But the guy had handcuffs on. Again, I have no idea why he was there. I didn't ask him. Didn't thought that may be rude. Um, but the, the two seemed to get along pretty well. And I, it was kind of interesting. It was fascinating to me to see the interaction between this officer and the prisoner there who was there for some kind of treatment. But uh, that seems to be what's, what's happening here. I mean, they weren't best buds by any means, but they were decent to each other. And again, that seems to be what's going on between Julian and the Apostle Paul. The centurion treats Paul with consideration. He's still the centurion, Paul is still the prisoner, but they are decent to each other. And part of this is uh, that when they come ashore at Sidon, the centurion had allowed Paul to go to his friends to receive care. And that's interesting. That seems rather unusual. And I'm just trying to put myself in Julian's place. If I'm transporting a bunch of prisoners across the Mediterranean world, I'm thinking it's not likely for me to let them hang out with their friends in town when we stop for the night. That just doesn't seem like that would be done. So I think it shows the centurion's respect for Paul. I'm thinking the centurion probably has other issues to deal with, other discipline problems going on or whatever, and he probably knows Paul is an innocent man and that he simply appealed to Caesar for his own protection. So it's in Paul's best interest to get back on the boat in the morning. Uh, starting in verse 4, they head out into the Mediterranean, but they almost immediately run into some rough weather. Uh, they had been, uh, they go between the coast and Cyprus, so they're sail sailing just south of Cilicia and Pamphylia, uh, landing at Myra in Lycia. So again, the, the wind is picking up, things are happening. Archaeologists, by the way, have discovered the remains of grain storage bins in Myra. And at this point, instead of continuing on this ship, as it was probably about to head north up the coast toward Troas, back to his home port of Adramidium, instead of staying on this ship, they instead change ships in Myra, getting on another ship that is heading west toward Italy. This is now an Alexandrian ship, which I assume is a reference to a ship based in Alexandria, Egypt. I know there were other Alexandrias, that's just the most famous in my mind. Uh, I would also assume that this might have been a larger ship, maybe more suitable for crossing the Mediterranean. So this other ship was just kind of a, a coast-hugging ship, and they weren't getting too far out there in the deep, but this other ship is ready to go. And so they're heading west toward Italy. And so it's now an Alexandrian ship, and uh, they, they are now kind of changing their uh, course at this point. Again, later in this chapter, we'll find a total of 276 people on board. And again, to me, that seems huge, especially for an ancient ship. I'm thinking of um, what's been described as the Jesus boat they discovered over at the Sea of Galilee that would hold a dozen, maybe two dozen people. But this is clearly a, a lot larger than that. Josephus, the Roman historian, who is a Jewish man, he mentions an ancient ship that carried 600 passengers. And that, that's a pretty decent sized ship for modern times, but especially for back then. The military at that time, the Roman army, had ships that could carry a thousand soldiers. And again, I'm sure they aren't all decked out in their little rooms. They're probably stacked in there, but I'm just saying they had some very large ships in the ancient world, and this is apparently one of them. Uh, but even in this new ship, they have a hard time even getting up the coast a bit to Sinaitis. And instead of heading straight west, they head for the shelter of Crete down there to the southwest. That's the uh, green map, uh, green line on the map there, as that line indicates. But even this is difficult, and they're having a hard time. They come to a place called Fairhaven on the southern coast of Crete. So let's pick up then with the next paragraph, Acts 27, verses 9 through 12. Acts 27, 9 through 12. When considerable time had passed and the voyage was now dangerous, since even the fast was already over, Paul began to admonish them and said to them, Men, I perceive that the voyage will certainly be with damage and great loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. But the centurion was more persuaded by the pilot and the captain of the ship than by what was being said by Paul. 
Because the harbor was not suitable for wintering, the majority reached a decision to put out to sea from there if somehow they could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete, facing southwest and northwest, and spend the winter there. We'll get back to uh, the map on this one a little bit zoomed in, because in this last paragraph they're heading for Fair Haven, near the city of La Silla. Uh, now, though, somewhere on their way to Fair Haven, the voyage gets even more dangerous than it was before. Considerable time has passed, so I don't know if we're talking days or weeks here, uh, but uh, considerable time has passed. So they're, they're sailing, they're sailing, they're sailing, and they don't seem to be getting anywhere. And I think of trying to paddle a canoe upstream. And if you've done that, <laughs> what, a, what a workout that is. And I, I'm remembering, I think, our first year up at Beaver Creek Bible Camp. We were lost a couple canoes in the in the falls we had to go downstream to get them so a bunch of us went down then we were coming back up with one person per canoe this is staff so if you had kids then don't worry um the staff was doing this so we were coming back we were just digging in uh paddling with all our might and just paddling 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 and then we were looking at the shore and we were not moving that's uh, so discouraging so that seems to be what's going on here um they're just really working at this but they're just uh, really not making much progress at all we have a brief reference to the fast being over. We don't have any real details on this, just this brief reference. It's most likely a reference to the Day of Atonement, where God said they were to afflict their souls on this day in the fall of that year. Uh, every year, it was in the fall of the year. In 59 AD, when this takes place, the Day of Atonement fell on October 5th. So October 5th, AD 59. And so if this is really a reference to the Day of Atonement, which we think that it is, and if this takes place in 59 AD, which we think that it does based on piecing this together from other accounts, then we have an actual date on the calendar for what happens here. And that is pretty amazing to me. So we're talking about October 5th, AD 59. That is very specific, isn't it? Um, so Luke then seems to be telling us that Fall is very quickly turning to winter. So just like around here in October, it, it's almost, you know, the end is near. And uh, we have uh, one ancient writer telling us that it was extremely dangerous to sail in the Mediterranean from September 14th to November 11th. That was like the danger season. And it was basically impossible. It was a death wish to do this anytime after November 11th. So this is right then in the middle of that dangerous time of year to sail. And, you know, good for us. Luke kind of nails it down here. Uh, Paul then admonishes them. I don't think all 276 were gathered together. Maybe they were, maybe they weren't. I'm assuming this is a reference to uh, the leaders on this voyage. So Paul is kind of included in on this, which speaks well of him. But Paul's message is this trip will not end well. And in fact, if we continue, we're in danger of losing not only the cargo in the ship, but we're in danger of losing our own lives as well. And as I was reading this, at, at first I assumed this is Paul's inspired advice, like God told me to tell you people this. And I, I was thinking this because Paul was not a sailor, was he? He was a tent maker. Well, what does he know about sailing? And so we've got a tent maker giving advice to professional sailors. And that really didn't make much sense to me unless this message comes from God. And so I was thinking, okay, this has got to be some kind of inspired revelation here. However, I was reading Wayne Jackson's commentary on this, and he points out that when Paul says that he perceives that this trip will be a disaster, he's not using a word that normally refers to inspiration, but he's using a word based on what he knows from experience. And as I remember it, I didn't look it up myself, but I believe that word is the same word that we would use today for theory. Like if you have a theory on something, you've made some observations, and this is your prediction on what would happen next. Not necessarily like a, a law of science, but this is a, we've got a theory. We've got a working theory based on what we see. This is what we think will happen. And this is apparently the word that Paul uh, uses here. So I'm kind of leaning away from the inspiration idea on this statement from Paul. God did not necessarily tell him this at this point in this chapter, but this is probably based on his experience. And when we think about it like that, we realize this is now Paul's fourth official journey, isn't it? And he's probably done quite a bit more traveling than this through the years, and he's chased down Christians all over the Mediterranean world before he became a Christian. So, uh, Paul has spent quite a bit of time on the sea, and so I, I think it's very safe to say that he's speaking up here based on his own experience. Based on what I see, 
people, you know, this is not going to end well. And so he gives his peace, he speaks what he has to say, and then they enter back into this discussion. In verse 11, it seems as if the centurion plays a key role in deciding what to do. So he represents the Roman Empire in this scenario. However, the centurion is more persuaded by the pilot and the captain than he is by the Apostle Paul. Uh, the reference to the captain is most likely a reference to the owner of the ship or the owner's representative. And so we've got the owner who has quite a bit at stake financially. Then we've got the pilot, apparently the professional hired by the owner to get the ship safely and efficiently from one place to another. Then we've got Paul in this reference, a prisoner with quite a bit of experience sailing, at least being on ships in the Mediterranean. And we've got the centurion. And the buck stops with the centurion, but the centurion is more persuaded by the pilot and the captain as opposed to listening to Paul. And really, it's hard for us to blame the centurion. Maybe we can imagine being in his place. He's a soldier. This is not his deal. This is not what he does. He's not a professional sailor. So he's got this professional sailor, the captain, then he's got the owner of the boat. Surely these two men know what they're doing. And these two men are suggesting that they keep going. And remember, there is a financial consideration here. They got to get their cargo to where it needs to go. And then there's this prisoner over here who makes the case they need to stop right where they are or everybody might die. Well, it's not an easy decision to make, but the centurion is more swayed by the professional sailors than he is by Paul. And so they continue on this journey. In verse 12, the majority make the decision to put out to sea again. Uh, just a quick note, the majority cannot always be trusted to make the right decision. Isn't that a good lesson? I think we can learn from this paragraph. It's not necessarily why this is in the Bible, but I think we have a lot of people today who read the words even of the Apostle Paul, and they say, oh, no, surely that can't be right. Okay, all in favor of doing it some other way, say aye. Doesn't that happen today? I think we kind of see that's, in a secular sense, what happened here. So um, I think this is probably one reason why we don't live under a true democracy in our country. We live under a representative republic, a constitutional republic, as it's been described. There is no perfect system, but this is one example, I think, in this chapter of a majority vote making a really, really bad decision. And we might take this as a reminder that the Lord's Church is not a democracy, is it? The church is not a democracy. The Lord's church is a kingdom. The Lord is our king. He is our benevolent dictator, we might say. He makes all the rules. We answer to him, but he loves us. So he is the king who loves us. We don't take votes on what we believe, but we take our orders from him. And we are simply servants in his kingdom. Nevertheless, they vote. They put out to sea. They're hoping to make it over to Phoenix on the southwestern edge of the island of Crete. And it seems rather doable from a human perspective. It's not too far. We're going to be along the shore here. How bad could it be? So their goal is to make it to Phoenix and then to stay there for the rest of the winter. So let's conclude tonight with Acts 27 verses 13 through 20. The last paragraph for tonight. We'll pick up with the next one next week. But tonight, Acts 27, 13 through 20. When a moderate south wind came up, supposing that they had attained their purpose, they weighed anchor and began sailing along Crete, close inshore. But before very long, there rushed down from the land a violent wind called Uroquillo. And when the ship was caught in it and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and let ourselves be driven along. Running under the shelter of a small island called Clauda, we were scarcely able to get the ship's boat under control. After they had hoisted it up, they used supporting cables in undergirding the ship, and fearing that they might run aground on the shallows at Syrtis, they let down the sea anchor, and in this way let themselves be driven along. The next day, as we were being violently storm-tossed, they began to jettison the cargo, and on the third day they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. Since neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small storm was assailing us, from then on all hope of our being saved was gradually abandoned. Once again, we do have quite a few names, so we're going to go back to a map here. They leave Fair Haven, hoping to get to Phoenix for the winter, but as they travel along the southern edge of Crete, a strong wind comes up, and it's common, so there is even a name for this wind, kind of like we might refer today to an Alberta clipper or a nor'easter. We hear those words, and because of our culture, the way that we've been raised, we understand what those mean. 
and they've done the same thing so they have a name for this wind and the wind coming down from Cree pushes them along in a way that they cannot turn around to face it so there, there's no way that they can adjust their course they just have to go with it uh, several months ago I told you about my first time kayaking on Lake Monona uh, back in the summer of 2020 uh, kind of got a kayak to do some outdoor exercise type thing by myself away from other human beings with the pandemic and all and I had no idea what I was doing, so I, I put in at Esther Park Beach, just north of Southtown Mall, kind of on the southern edge of Lake Monona. Monona. And once I got out in the water, I knew that I made a very, very bad decision. Didn't look too bad from shore, but once I got just a few feet out, I said to myself, oh no, and I'm pretty sure I said that out loud. Uh, the wind was blowing, the waves were so high, I could not turn the kayak around without flipping over. Because, you know, if you go with the waves, you'll roll. And so I just had to keep going. I just had to go perpendicular to the waves. And I'm like, I'm going to land somewhere, but I can't turn. So I don't know how this is going to end, but I'm just going that way. And uh, and that's the way it went. And thankfully, I ended up going down toward the Hara River and kind of getting out of where the waves were really bad. But I think that's kind of what they're talking about here. Sometimes in a boat, you really don't have a choice as to what direction you're going if the weather's bad. And that seems to be the case here. They couldn't turn. And so they allow themselves simply to be driven along. Notice in verse 16, Luke refers to running under the shelter of a small island called Clouda. Uh, Clouda was not on this map. So once again, I put a little star there. If you can barely see that right over the last E in the word Crete. And so that indicates the location of the island called Clouda, just offshore of, uh, just off the coast of Crete. So they stay close to that island. I believe this is the southernmost point in Europe. And uh, it was in the news a few years ago, some Russian men went down there and there's this cliff and they built a concrete chair. Looks like a dining room chair up on top of the, the uh, cliff there. And it's just kind of labeled the southernmost point in Europe. But that was their mission. They accomplished it. So they are uh, right there by Clouda. They stay close to that island. The wind is so fierce they can barely make, uh, uh, can barely control the ship's boat. As I understand it, that's a reference to something like we would refer to as a lifeboat, a little boat they would tow along. They could use it to go into shore when they couldn't get this close with a big boat. And uh, sometimes they would use it to place the anchor. So they put the anchor in the little boat, carry it over here, drop it, and then they pull the big boat along if they had to get it into a harbor or something like that. So instead of losing the ship's boat, it seems they either haul it in and bring it on board or they tie it close to the ship, something like that. Also in verse 17, Luke tells us that they use supporting cables in undergirding the ship. Uh, basically, they're holding the ship together with ropes that are passed underneath it to keep the ship from disintegrating in the water. That's a scary situation, isn't it? To have to hold your boat together like that. So they would kind of slip it down from each side and get underneath it and then tighten it up on the top just to make sure it didn't fall apart. Uh, toward the end of verse 17, Luke says they were afraid that they might run aground on the shallows of Sirtis. The word Sirtis refers to a shoal, S-H-O-A-L, or a shallow, basically a sandbar. I think we're kind of more familiar with sandbars and rivers up here in Wisconsin. And again, I think back to our time on the Eau Claire River. When you're tubing or canoeing, hitting sandbars can be a real hassle. It really slows your progress going down the river. Well, in the Mediterranean... In a ship, in a storm, in the wind, hitting a sandbar could be disastrous. Not just, you know, kind of ruin your day, end your life kind of disaster. So they let down the sea anchor and they allow themselves to be dragged along. So they may hit the sand, but they're going to hit it slower than they would have otherwise. Uh, this continues into the following day. This is a major storm. It keeps coming. I think one of the commentaries said the word um, that we would associate with typhoon is used in this passage here so uh, a very strong storm so they start throwing stuff overboard they start with the cargo uh, the items they are being paid to transport so once they get rid of stuff that they were paid to transport it's kind of no point in making the trip but this is life and death so they start with the cargo uh, the third day they throw the ship's tackle overboard so these are the items they need to operate the ship um, furniture perhaps on board maybe an extra mast or extra sails ropes tools that kind of thing all that stuff goes overboard the storm continues notice luke indicates in verse 20 they basically have given up hope at this point they see no way out of this there's no way of being saved but they're just dragged along across the mediterranean sea uh, what's the significance of not seeing the stars i don't think luke really nails it down for us but i think we understand what he means there it, they have no idea where they are, do they? They can't see the stars. That It's raining, there's wind, they don't know where they are. 
uh, they have no way to navigate after a while, so other than to look for landmarks. And they have apparently just completely given up any hope of ever making out of this situation alive. So this brings us to a, a good place to pause. We don't have any amazing doctrinal lessons in this passage. And I think it may be tempting to wonder, well, why is this even in the Bible? Why do we know stuff about Phoenix and and that kind of thing? Why, why, why do we have this information here? And... Um, you know, what is the point of all of this? And I think the, these words are obviously here for a reason. This is inspired. We need to be looking at this. And first of all, I think we gain some respect for Paul in this passage. I think that's a safe thing to say about this passage. We learn more about him. Uh, later, Paul will refer to some of this very briefly in giving himself some credibility with the church in Corinth. In 2 Corinthians 11, for example, he's dealing with some false teachers who are leading people astray, dismissing Paul as being a real apostle. Oh, who does he think he is? And that kind of thing. Well, Paul uses this, this experience, and a whole lot of other things he endured to help prove that he really is worthy of being listened to. And this is part of it. This is where we learn the truth of what actually happened, and then we have the reference later in 2 Corinthians 11. So, so this passage really helps us appreciate a good chunk of the rest of the New Testament. So as we read through Paul's letters, uh, this passage helps us to understand what Paul was going through. It helps us empathize with him. It helps us to have some more respect for him as a gospel preacher. He was not a fair weather preacher. He was there for all of this. Um, the other part of this is that this passage also reminds us that Luke is writing history, isn't he? Again, we've seen this in the book of Acts a number of times, but we see it again here. These are not made-up names for made-up places. The Bible is not a book that takes place once upon a time in a land far, far away. Uh, this is not a fairy tale, but the Bible is a book of history. Luke is a medical doctor, but he writes this section as an eyewitness. I was there. And so he's including details like the direction of the wind and what the wind was called and the names of ports and the name of the centurion and the name of this island and that island and these shoals over here in the Mediterranean that we can still find today and just over and over and over. So this passage reminds us that Luke is writing what we would describe today as nonfiction. This is not a fiction book that he's writing. These are actual places and he's describing an event that actually happened on October 5th, 1859 or whatever you know that date was. Um, as I was preparing for tonight's lesson, I ran across an, a copy of National Geographic going back to April 1998. And they had an article in this edition of, of National Geographic that was uh, dealing with shipwrecks in the Mediterranean Sea. Ancient shipwrecks and their efforts to find these. And they actually uh, have some amazing pictures in here. They, they have a really good map with uh, many of the same names in the same places and some similar descriptions of the way things went down like that. And, and, and this map matches almost exactly the map that I've showed you here on the screen tonight. And these places are very similar, or identical actually, but a lot of them are repeated in both places. Uh, they describe using a nuclear-powered submarine from the United States Navy to help recover a 300-pound anchor that was found in the southwest Mediterranean right off Sirtis there, right in this place where we're talking about right now. And 2,600 feet under the surface, they find this. It was so well-preserved that they simply put a cable through the eye of that iron anchor. It didn't fall apart. They just they strung it up like a like a normal anchor and hauled it to the surface using a an inflatable boat. And in the article they described finding debris uh, spread in straight lines scattered all over these areas, but they would find little little straight lines of debris, little like jars of grain and wine or whatever, just to scatter just as if they were unloading cargo off a ship in a storm, just as exactly as it's described in tonight's class. And so I'm just saying tonight's account should really increase our faith in the record of Scripture. If you have access to National Geographic from April 1998, uh, I would highly recommend this article. It was a very amazing thing. Uh, hopefully next week we can finish chapter 27 and get to the point where we finally see these people arriving safely on shore. We do have some other contenders for the ABCs tonight. Through the years, some have suggested a Mediterranean cruise, which is interesting, a shipwreck, 
or at sea, uh, something like that. But uh, I think for now I'm still going with arriving safely on shore just because of what happens later. But let me know if you have any other ideas. But uh, thank you for taking the time to study together. I hope to see you on Sunday at either 9 or 11 and also at 10 for a class in between. Let me know if you have anything that we need to be praying about. But let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are truly the master of ocean and earth and skies, and we praise you tonight for your providential care for the Apostle Paul and for the others who were with him on that ship. We're thankful for Luke's record of what happened on that voyage, and we're thankful for discoveries that continue to be made in that part of the world. We pray that we would learn from Paul's courage in taking the good news to all parts of the known world at great personal cost. We pray that we would have wisdom and courage as he did to speak up today to represent you well. Our Father, we come to you in the name of your Son, Jesus, our Savior and our Lord. Amen.